hello, Connecting Point. I want to start off with a table talk to refresh our memories about what we've been studying. What kind of king was Israel looking for? Compare Yahweh, the king that Israel had, to Saul or the hope of Saul as king. Go ahead with that. Last week, Rebecca took us through the signs of uh, what would confirm Saul as the future king of Israel. And this week, our text uh, starts by telling us that all of these signs came about. I can just imagine Saul in his increased shock and dismay as each one of these signs came about. Um, you'll remember that uh, the first one was that two men would come and tell him that his father was worried about him. I can imagine Saul just thinking, well, that could be a coincidence. And then the next one was that three men will come and, and give you two loaves of bread. Oh, that seems oddly specific. Maybe Samuel did know what he was talking about. And then the third one uh, was that Saul would meet a band of prophets and musicians at the hill of God near a Philistine garrison. That the spirit of the Lord would come upon him and that he would be transformed into a different person and prophesy and led by the Holy Spirit. Oh my, Saul is really in for it, isn't he? This third sign is where our text opens up today, and we're going to read and learn a little bit more about Saul and about the people he will be leading. So let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 10, and we're going to pick up in verse 9. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servants, Where did you go? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, Set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they saw him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Saul said to Samuel, sorry, and Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him who the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted, Long live the king! Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. But some worthless fellows said, How can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. But he, Saul, held his peace. Okay, so we have two contrasting sides here where Yahweh is confirming for Saul that he would be king. But then there's all of this doubt being cast on Saul by himself and, and by those who knew him. Right? We saw last week that uh, Samuel 
uh, introduces himself to Saul, really, and, and shows himself to be a true prophet by telling him about the donkeys. And then Saul, Samuel anoints Saul as king and then prophesies about these three more signs that, that Saul would experience. He experiences those signs, including um, this, this uh, kind of being taken over by the Spirit of the Lord. But he still has this uncertainty about maybe his ancestry, whether he could be qualified for kingship. That's one of the things we, uh, Rebecca touched on a little bit last week. But then uh, also, when those who knew Saul saw him prophesying, they questioned it. Well, perhaps this could have planted even more doubt in Saul's mind as to whether he was worthy of being named king. To add to Saul's self-doubt, we read that is Saul among the prophets became a popular saying. What? <laughs> I feel like this is maybe one of those lines that gets lost in translation because it does not seem like a catchphrase to me. But I think it's kind of getting at this idea that uh, Saul is behaving out of character. And we'll, we'll come back to that thought uh, after the next table talk. So if you're curious, we'll, we'll get there. But then Saul avoids the topic of kingship when he's questioned by his uncle. Could Saul actually think of himself as king? Could Saul's family and friends see him as a king? Saul may look strong and capable on the outside, but there are many indicators that there is not as much uh, strength, maybe, on the inside. Uh, Saul has received sign after sign from Yahweh, but he's plagued with self-doubt and the doubt of those who are closest to him. Will Saul trust God? Will he trust what others think of him or say about him? I want us to dive into what Saul might be thinking or feeling with a table talk. What Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit, just like me, Saul looked the part of a king, at least from the outside perspective, People made assumptions about him because of how he looked. They treated him in certain ways, and maybe Saul began to see himself in a certain light because of the way people were treating him. So here's the question. How do you share with others what God is doing in your life? Do you doubt the promises that God has made to you? Is it easier to discuss with strangers or other people of God than with friends and family? Go ahead with that. I want to zoom in on this couplet for a minute. What has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? This saying that emerged highlights the transformation that Samuel foretold would happen in Saul from the old man to the new man. At this time, Saul is with those who already knew him, his friends and family, so they were in a position to testify to the difference, the before and after. The couplet also emphasizes their surprise and astonishment that this transformation took place in Saul. They apparently didn't see Saul as the prophet type. Then we read this philosopher's response. I'm calling him the philosopher <laughs> because of the way that he uh, interjects into this, uh, this scene that we find ourselves in. Uh, so the philosopher is kind of doing this, let me answer your question with another question. And who is their father? I feel like this is something of a scene from a Monty Python sketch. The, the pronouns make this question confusing and the commentators I read vary on their interpretation, but I'll give you my conclusion. I think the philosopher's question is rhetorical and it's meant to remind us and everyone who is the father of all the prophets, father, capital F, father of all the prophets. And the answer is obvious. God, not man, is the one who determines who his prophets will be. The spirit of God empowers his prophets for ministry and the spirit of God empowers Saul for leadership. Saul's ancestry is irrelevant. So then we have Saul's experience with the Spirit of God and these prophets in chapter 10. It's, it's the first of many encounters, actually, that Saul will have with spirits and prophets in the coming chapters. And in each of these cases, it seems that Saul's affectation by the Spirit is temporary. 
And we find as we continue in our study that there are other spirits afflicting Saul. It's not just the spirit of God. Nevertheless, Saul is appointed an anointed king and prophet. He is given everything he needs to lead the people of God, to live up to this vocation. And yet, in the face of the people, he hides. He's overly concerned with what others think of him. And I don't know what you think about that, but it, it gives me pause. I realize that Saul is like me. He's broken and wounded and riddled with self-doubt. You know, I, I try to make good choices, but sometimes I don't. <laughs> sometimes I listen to the criticism of others over and above the promises of God. And despite Saul's inner frailty, God is on a rescue mission. Saul's frailty and all, Saul happens to be the one that God chooses. And Saul didn't do anything to deserve it. And yet God's promises are going to be fulfilled. And we can all say, thank you, Jesus. There is hope for me too. And we have Samuel's speech. He says, you have cast aside with the God who delivers you from all your enemies and troubles. And you have said, no, you shall put a king over us. So we have the elders of Israel looking for someone that they could control and manipulate. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. And yet here we see that it is Yahweh that is still in control. Despite the nation of Israel rejecting Yahweh as their king and choosing to pursue a king of their own making, Saul, we can see God's redemptive work in the making. First of all, Saul's lineage from the tribe of Benjamin is an act of redemption. It was only a generation or two ago that the tribe of Benjamin was nearly cut out of the nation of Israel. They were left with only a few hundred men and they were on the run in the wilderness, hiding from their fellow Israelites from fear that they too would be destroyed. And here we see Yahweh raising up the lowly. We recall back to Hannah's prayer in chapter two, verse eight says, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the garbage pile. He, <laughs> the garbage pile, hmm, no. He sets them with noble men and gives them a throne of honor. Uh, number two, in God's redemptive plan, and something that really struck me this week in my study was that even though the introduction of a monarchy is brought about through the people of God rejecting God, what, what actually defines this period in biblical history is that this is a period of uniting a kingdom. Church, our God is a God who can take the broken and short-sighted desires and of, of sinners like us, and he, he still can use them to accomplish his purposes. I like what Nancy Guthrie has to say on it. She says, oftentimes in the Bible, we see that God judges people not by withholding what they ask for, but by giving them what they ask for. Last week, Rebecca mentioned that the Hebrew word for Saul is a form of the verb to ask. The nation of Israel asked and God replied by giving them Saul. Saul was precisely what the people were requesting. He was handsome. He stood head and shoulders above the rest. He looked the part. We've already seen that he's extremely manipulable, impressionable. He only needs for someone to tell him what to do and he does it. He's essentially a puppet king. And the third indication that Yahweh is working to redeem Israel in, is in this repetitive sighting of the Exodus story. You'll recall we talked about, uh, I think this was two weeks ago, we talked about the meaning of the Exodus story for the people of Israel. It would seem that there's a parallel here between the oppression that the Israelites experienced in Egypt and the current predicament that they're in with the Philistines. And I think we can see this as both a warning and a promise. It's a warning 
that Israel is doomed to slavery without the intervention of Yahweh. And it is a promise of God's faithfulness to deliver his people. He brought you up out of Egypt before. He can deliver you now. And we find Saul is in hiding. <laughs> Samuel organizes the people by tribe and by family and then casts lots to confirm before the people who would be their king. It's a little funny in my study, I found that the verb used for drawing lots could also refer to being caught or trapped. It's almost as if Saul is being incriminated among the people rather than elevated. <laughs> and here it seems the Monty Python skit is continuing when we have these two descriptions of Israel's future king back to back. We have, oh, there he is. He's hiding among the baggage. And then Samuel follows up <laughs> with, there is none like him among all the people. <laughs> I can just imagine Saul. I mean, he just, this poor guy, he, I don't think he wants the job. Uh, he's, he's really waffling back and forth and, and trying to figure out what he's going to do next, I think. And then our, our text closes by noting that some stalwart fellows follow Saul and some worthless fellows spurn him. This is the beginnings of Saul's army. God is touching the hearts of his people to invite them back into his plan. And it's worth noting again that Saul is Yahweh's anointed. Yahweh is not opposed to Saul. He's opposed to being rejected in favor of a monarchy that would replace him. Um, and then there are some wicked men here rejecting Saul. And that phrase, wicked men, is the same phrase that was used to describe Hophni and Phinehas back in chapter 2. You'll remember that when Hophni and Phinehas were presented with the word of the Lord, they would not listen. And now these men are being presented with the Lord's anointed, and they despise him. They do not bring him a gift, which was the custom. And Saul still bewildered at this new appointment as king. He just ignores their derision. But not everyone is ignoring them. Some people are paying attention and we're going to find out what happens to these worthless fellows next week. Da, da, da. So I'm going to start to wrap this up here. So bear with me because I have a few more things that I think are important. It's important that we see the connection between the work of Saul and the work of Christ. We see the foreshadowing of Christ actually in Saul, even though we kind of tend to think of Saul as somewhat of a villain because because we know his whole story. But there is, there is a lot of foreshadowing in Saul's life and kingship. They are both anointed of God, a deliverer of Israel. Both were labeled as a madman. That one it was not really explicit in our text today, but it'll come up. They were both immersed in the spirit of God and a prophet. And Saul, like Jesus, is the anticipated king. I think of the Christmas song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, saying, Yet in the darkness shining the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. This is the mentality of Israel in this moment, that they are fearful about their circumstances and hopeful that Saul will be the one to bring them a future and a hope. We can also look to our thesis, Hannah's Prayer in chapter 2 for insight. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Hannah's Prayer looks beyond her own circumstances to the next generation, to the coming king in Saul, who will deliver Israel from their enemies. But then the prayer looks even further to celebrate the coming king Jesus, who will conquer all of sin and death and take up his kingship over a kingdom that will not end. God is going to use Saul so that the nation of Israel God's people can participate in God's promises and God's future for them. This sounds a lot like Jesus. 
We can also see ourselves in Saul. The Spirit of God came upon Saul in such a powerful way that it transformed him into a new man. We'll remember our recurring theme in 1 Samuel that God has both the willingness to intervene and the power to transform. God transforms Saul's heart, but to what end? It's so that he can be used by God. We similarly are a new creation in Christ, transformed by him. The old has gone and the new has come, just as Paul would tell us, remind us in 2 Corinthians. Each one of us has been called out, anointed, and chosen by God to lead people. Whether you're a parent or a coworker or a student or a neighbor or a friend, you are to be a leader among a people who have rejected Jesus as their king. You, like Saul, are called to reflect the rulership and reign of a God who willingly lays down his life in order to reconcile us to himself. Did you catch that? That after Israel spurns Yahweh, he still, Yahweh still makes a way for them to participate in his promises. The heart of a father is so clearly seen here. And, you know, as a parent, it doesn't matter how many times my children spurn me and they ought to be the ones coming to apologize or to make amends uh, to me. No, as a parent, I go to them. I take responsibility for the relationship upon myself and I lay down my pride and I pursue reconciliation with them regardless of what they're going to do. This is the heart of our Father God. Not that we first loved him or apologized to him or made amends to him, but that he first loved us, that he made amends on our behalf. We didn't deserve this gift, but he gave it to us anyhow. And why has God transformed our lives other than that we may be used by him? This is the gospel of Christ. With this, new th with this theme of new creation and leadership in your mind, I want to send you to our last table talk by quoting Jean Edwards. There is a vast difference between the outward clothing of the Spirit's power and the inward filling of the Spirit's life. What characteristics do you look for in a leader? Gifted men and women who are outwardly empowered or broken men and women who are inwardly transformed? What kind of leader do you aspire to be? And make sure to take some time to pray for one another. God bless you. We will see you next week.